Hello and welcome to the Skin Works. I'm John Riarte, creator of digital programs at the Photographers Gallery. Uh, Skin Work is a collaborative program by Photo Museum Winterthur and the Photographers Gallery, supported uh, by Pro Helvetia. Screen Works is a fortnightly series of live stream events led by artists, curators, and researchers who take the audience on an exploration of the digital spaces where their practice takes place. We aim to offer the possibility to get a close access to the work processes and the tools that they use, as well as to the core ideas and the issues that they address. All the speakers that we invite are working with network culture and pushing forward the photographic medium. Uh, just a few technicalities for those of you in Zoom. Uh, your microphone should be muted. If not, please go ahead and, and please mute uh, yourself. And uh, also just to let you know that uh, this event is being recorded and will be archived and shared. So please turn off your camera if you don't want to be uh, recorded. And hello from me too. Uh, my name is Marco Demutis. I work as digital curator at Photo Museum Winterthur. And today we are very excited to have Mishka Henner to taking us for a screen walk and a space walk. Images of space have always been connected to digital image technologies, from the computer graphics that NASA first used to visualize planets and stars, to the transmissions of photographic information gathered by Russian and American probes. These days, though, images of rocket launches and dreams of colonizing Mars populate all corners of the internet, from conspiracy theory forums to live satellite views, Images of space have always accompanied the desire of exploring the uncharted, leaving one's problem behind and starting fresh. So in this sense, we could say that space photography is equally looking outside as much as it reveals our own intimate, social, personal, and inner journey. Today, Mishka Henner will take us on a tour attempting to leave Earth while looking back at our planet and our society. All of this through his own screen, traveling from YouTube to Google Earth, from Google Street View to other online visioning tools. Mishka Henner is an artist who has reflected, interrogated, and provoked the photographic medium in its diverse forms. He often appropriates online and public images, raising issues of use and value of photography and its contemporary transformations in its digital and network form. He's no, strange, uh, he's no stranger um, to playful provocations, but also poetic impressions, revealing new ways of seeing, new forms of representation, as well as new landscapes, all mediated through the different forms of imaging systems that surround us and extend our vision. His work has been exhibited internationally in venues that include MoMA New York, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Turner Contemporary, and Hasselblad Foundation, amongst many others. His works are collected by the Arts Council England Collection, Victoria and Albert Museum, New York Public Library, and the Cleveland Museum of Arts, amongst others. He received the world's smallest photography award, the Kleine Hans Award, in 2011, and, I was award, and was awarded the ICP Infinity Award for Art in New York in 2013. He's part of the ABC Artists Books Cooperative and lives and works in Manchester, England. He has works currently on view at Frankel Gallery in San Francisco and the Guggenheim, New York, and is also part of an upcoming show at the Jean Quentin Gautier Gallery in Paris. So, hello, Mishka. Thank you so much for joining us and accepting our invitation. The screen is yours. Hi everybody, thanks for joining me on the live from the International Space Station, several hundred miles above the planet. Um, so uh, I, I'm gonna talk um, about a number of ideas and projects tonight. And um, I titled the talk Cabin Fever because it seems like a concept that uh, many of us will be <clears throat> well aware of now more than ever um, with this pandemic and the various states of lockdown all over the world. But it's also, of course, a condition that, um, uh, that is named after what many of the pioneers in uh, the American West experienced when they were all alone in their cabins on the frontiers of the American West, and of course, what uh, astronauts and cosmonauts can experience as well, far away from home. So it felt like a really uh, apt title to um, to give to tonight's talk. 
Um, I wanted to start with um, uh, a moment that really left a mark on me in um, the 90s that uh, I came across in a, in a great film called Out of the Present, which is a documentary film about um, the experience of cosmonauts on Mir who was stuck on the Soviet space station uh, in 1991 as the Soviet Union collapsed. I just wanted to start off with um, a clip from that film. So that's um, Sergei Krikalev who was talking there, who was uh, the, the one astronaut who um, couldn't be relieved of his duty after four months on Mir, and so had to stay on for the full nine months, which meant that um, as he was up there, the Soviet Union collapsed. And there's a remarkable uh, and an amazing exchange that I heard in the archives of the Pompidou in the in the early 2000s when I was living in Paris, which was a telephone recording between Krikalev, who was on the space station and his wife who worked in uh, mission control on the ground. And Krikalev talked about how he, he looked out of the window after so many months in space, he looked out of the window and, and saw only blackness, there was only darkness and the novelty of space travel and, uh, and the, the novelty of being so far above Earth had completely worn, worn, worn off. Um, all he could see was darkness. There was nothing up there for him, he told his wife. And his wife responded that when she looked out of her apartment window in Moscow, she saw tanks and rioters on the streets. And this was the moment that, um, that the, the country was falling apart. And she said, my world is collapsing here too. Everything we know is, is gone. And um, for me, I, I really, I've, I've never forgotten that exchange. And I've, I've, I've always really, uh, there's something really amazing about it, I think, which is that in a sense, it's, it's, it's two dreams disintegrating. One was the dream of um, a kind of socialist republic. And the other was one man's dream of space travel. Um, and that after nine months of being stuck up there, effectively, um, he realised that the, the 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 world he really wanted to belong to was was down on Earth, but even that was falling apart. So for me, I think that there's something really interesting about that kind of conundrum, especially now. For fast forward thirty years into in 2020, we seem to have a similar kind of thing going on where so much of the world that we knew is changing so radically and is almost on the, on the verge of collapse, it seems, whilst at the same time, there, is, there are these incredibly, incredibly aggressive um, aspirations to colonize Mars and to create a, a, a base on moon. But also I think uh, what's interesting is that in a sense, the world that we live in now resembles <laughs> in some ways the, 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 the mission control that was developed in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And this, the kind of remoteness, our, our remote experience of the world 
which has been just magnified by uh, the pandemic, has its seeds in this kind of um, this way of communicating and of experiencing the world, especially by those on the ground. And whether it's in nuclear infrastructure or energy infrastructure or space travel or traffic or even traffic control. And um, I think so in a sense, I think the mo this moment that we're in is, is, is a moment that's been going on for a long time. It's been, we've been building towards this, all the technologies in place in a sense. And in some cases has been developed or is a direct byproduct of, um, of our attempts to leave Earth. Um, this is a really uh, great site I came across, which is uh, it's just called Stuff in Dot Space, and it's a live tracker of all the satellites um, above Earth. And I wanted to show you this just to give you a sense of uh, how much of our stuff is in orbit around Earth. So this is everything from telecommunication satellites, GPS satellites, TV satellites, military intelligence, weather um you name it and um you can click on any one of these and you can see um the actual satellite live in orbit but it will also give you information about this is pegasus rb you can click on these and i'll tell you what they are so in a sense now um whereas in 91 obviously there were far fewer satellites in orbit now our planet is literally surrounded by these satellites and um i think it's um it's it's interesting to me that you have people like elon musk who think of space travel now not as some kind of utopian um way of exploring the universe but actually as the only uh, chance for our species to survive so Musk actually, when you hear him talk, has a very dark apocalyptic view of the future on Earth. And he thinks of space travel and he thinks of the, the need to colonize Mars as a kind of urgent thing that we have to get on with because actually we'll destroy ourselves, if not the Earth. Um, but in the last 10 years, I think for me, one of the most interesting images has been this one of, um, of an Austrian daredevil called Felix Baumgartner, who uh, jumped from uh, the Red Bull Stratos capsule in 2012 over the New Mexico desert. And there's th there've been since then, um, his record has been broken by, of all people, a, a Google engineer, uh, Alan Eustace, who tied himself to a weather balloon and jumped from even higher up than Baumgartner. But for me, these, these, this image of a, of a man falling back to earth, I think is, a, is a, a, quite a poetic counterpoint to the aspirations of space travel that actually in the last 20 or 30 years or so, we, we have been falling back to earth. We've not been going out there so much as crashing back to earth um, and realizing that maybe, um, our only chance to survive is to is to is to transform the way things are here. Um, now, this links is obviously. Um, I'm I'm really interested in all of this stuff, but also the the ways in which photography can be used to to describe these scales. So, um, I used to work in documentary photography where. Uh, in, in a kind of straight version of documentary photography where I wander the world with a camera, well, the, the north of England, more precisely, with a camera. Um, but I felt the camera was actually quite limited and uh, limited the range of subjects that I could talk about or um, deal with. And, um, and the, one of the earliest projects that I did without using my own camera was this work called Astronomical. So in a sense, what I'm, I'm going to begin with, um, uh, the arc of this talk will begin, begins in the solar system, um, in the far edges of the solar system, but will actually end up in people's living rooms. And uh, I want you to think of, of the camera, in a sense, as the camera and the computer as this kind of interface on the world 
And uh, well, actually the, camp, the computer gives us access to millions of cameras. And in a way, I think a lot of my work is just about navigating through all those different cameras that are already out there and trying to see what can be done with them. So astronomical is a, is a scale model of the solar system. It's, um, it was a work published in 2011 and uh, it's 12 volumes, 500 pages in each volume. And it's a, it's a scale model of the solar system. So each, the width of each page is equivalent to a million kilometers. So on pages one and two of volume one, you have the sun and uh, it fit perfectly. I just used a really cheap print on demand um, company called lulu.com. And uh, it's aimed at, um, at uh, allowing unpublished writers to publish their own books. But instead of filling my book with text, I would fill, I'd filled it with, with space, with black ink. So most of the uh, 6,000 pages are just black ink. And uh, on page 50, 155 of volume one is, is the earth there to scale to the sun. And um, in volume two, um, around the middle of volume two, there's Jupiter again to scale. And in volume three, my favorite uh, planet is um, Saturn. And uh, yesterday, NASA just landed a uh, probe on an asteroid 333 million kilometers away and collected a sample from this asteroid, a tiny asteroid. Um, and um, so that would have been on page 333 of volume one. Quite remarkable. And then on the final page of volume 12 is um, Pluto, uh, which is a tiny pixel, basically. Uh, so I made, uh, very simply, um, I made a, um, a kind of read through of, of, the, of, the vol of volume one and made a little uh, book trailer, if you like, and posted it online. So it's, uh, it's a read through the most exciting part of the solar system, which is the first five, the first volume, the first 500 million kilometers in which we see the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and um, about half of the asteroid belt. It's not, uh, it's, it's not a very exciting um, 10 minutes. I won't play the whole thing, um, but it's just to give you a sense of the work and um, I'm going to talk a little bit as well about how some of these works circulated on Earth, if you like, across the network and how uh, my appropriations were then appropriated by others, um, which I really love, actually. I think it's, it's one of the great joys of making work is seeing how others take it and what they do with it. Um, so anyway, let's move on. Uh, so this is one of the, um, I'll show you this, this is a, a GIF that somebody made. So somebody made a GIF of, of just a single, of, of just my hands going through it. And uh, it kind of went viral and ended up on um, a lot of um, Tumblr blogs, especially by Japanese goths, young Japanese goths. And um, they, would, they would post this without uh, crediting me. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. But I could do an, a reverse image search and see how the work was used. And they would post things like, this is, here's my autobiography, or, you know, every day of my life looks like this, which I really uh, loved. In fact, you can see some of them here on the, uh, uh, all right, what smart ass tore the last page out. I like that one, that's a good one. So worth the wait, pretty much my life right there. Um, and then I found uh, a few months ago that people had actually made music videos using this, which I mean, they're the worst music videos you'll ever see, but um, I was really surprised. Non ci credo, non avevo soldi, ma ero libero. Ora che ho le tasche piene, mi sento così misero. Your intention got a Bible 
To swear yeah. on that. Um, and then obviously in the ultimate appropriation, a stock image library has recreated um, the, <laughs> the, the, the read through that I did. Um, yeah, I'd love to know how many of those images they managed to sell, if any. Um, and then of course, and then of course, uh, you know, in in uh, the art world, so to speak, um, but work has had its own uh, life as well. Here, shown as part of New Photography 2015 at MoMA, and um, again it, here, just a very kind of pared down uh, version of the work, which is just it's, it's in a case. I mean, I'm, I made 130 sets in the end uh, before the publisher. Uh, refuse to make any more because actually every it, black ink is one of the most expensive things you can buy actually and um, so each book although I was getting each book for five pounds on lulu.com there were there was about 50 pounds worth of ink uh, of black ink in each book so actually lulu uh, refused to publish it after after a few years because they said they were losing about 45 pounds on each book uh, so that that came, that was the end, the natural end of that project. Um, and then here, this isn't this is uh, this isn't page one hundred and fifty five of volume one. This is actually an image taken by the Voyager space probe as um, as it was uh, making its way through the solar system. It's now in interstellar space, uh, but this is Earth from six billion kilometers away. So actually, um, level with where Pluto. Um, would be um, to, to the sun. Um, this was taken on Valentine's Day in 1990, and it's the it's the image that Carl Sagan referred to, where, where Carl Sagan referred to um, uh, um, the Earth as a pale blue dot for the first time. A Voyager. I've, I've, again, I was really fascinated by Voyager. So. Um, I don't know if you know, but there are two Voyager space probes and each one of them contains um, a golden record. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a message to extraterrestrials, but really I think it's, it's really a, a message to, to us about who we are. It was a kind of noble effort at trying to uh, condense all of humanity and all of the Earth's history on uh, one record. Um, and uh, prior to that was the Pioneer space probe, which sent, um, uh, which preceded the Voyager space probes by a few years. Pioneer is a lot slower than Voyager, so Voyager overtook it um, not that long after Pioneer launched. But the two Pioneer probes also carried a metal plaque, which was which was this a kind of engraved gold engraved plaque, and uh, on there are schematics referring not only to um, humans in the form of a male and female body, but also in, in relation to, in terms of where the space probe came from. So there's this schematic at the bottom, which um, places uh, Earth as the third rock from the sun with an arrow pointing to, uh, to Pioneer, to the Pioneer probes. And I, I had a show last year in November, um, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about called um, your only chance to survive is to leave with us. And uh, what I did was I, um, I took inspiration from the, of the Pioneer space probes. And uh, I, I spent a long time looking at intellectual property patents, which are all available online. There's, a Go you, there's an actual Google patents database, which contains every patent published uh, for as long as I can, for, for most of the 20th century and 21st century. So there are millions of these documents millions of documents that relate to um, to the kind of ownership of ideas and products. And they're often accompanied by these really great illustrations. And what I did was I took these illustrations and uh, engraved them in these gold plaques as though uh, instead of sending, instead of, instead of sending these uh, messages of who we are to uh, aliens, I really like the idea that we send them back to ourselves to, to see who we are as a civilization and the things that we developed. So this is a this is a patent 
relating to um, satellite navigation, uh, that to the navigation of satellites, sorry, um, as they move uh, in, in Earth orbit. And this one is a, a, a pattern illustration from a pattern on, on um, storm shelters. And I think, I think of these patents in a way as a kind of, as a, the DNA of our civilization, if you like. So what I really love about them is that they contain all of the sort of fears and aspirations and anxieties of our civilization. So these are, this is a weather, um, a weather monitoring device. Uh, by a, 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 this is a Korean patent. Um, and this is the, the movement of a snowflake in a in a video game, so this is a this is somebody who's in who's invented the movement of a snowflake, which again I think is is quite beautiful and poetic. Um, so, this is an installation shot of that show, and um, again, you know, all all of my work is is made from material found online, and the same was true here. So, um, uh, even the inspiration. Uh, for the show's title, your only chance to survive is to leave with us. It, it, it's not, it doesn't come from Elon Musk, that phrase, it comes from another guy, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but the working, the, the show included satellite images of, of various kind of energy infrastructures. This is a solar ranch in uh, the Mojave Desert in Southern California. And um, obviously these solar farms are huge. They're absolutely enormous. And this is just one detail of it. Um, and it obviously looks quite abstract, but close up you can make out the kind of dirt tracks and uh, little cars and bushes and so on. And then these are evaporation ponds from power stations. So evaporation ponds basically gather the toxic waste of power stations and the byproducts from um, of the water that circulates uh, in the power stations. And the sun basically just evaporates these ponds and it makes, the, it makes it much easier to get rid of the residue, the toxic residue from the power stations. But again, I really love this. Um, I really love the interface between and the interconnection between these earthly materials and the sun. So with the solar farm, the, our energy, uh, we found a way to harness the sun's energy. And with the evaporation ponds, we actually give our waste back to the sun. And then this is um, this is a, a medical invention, a patent from a medical invention, which is a kind of intravenous drip going through a nasal passage. But I thought there was something really haunting about this image. This, this was made in 2019, so before the pandemic. Um, but there were some really amazing uh, medical illustrations um, and inventions, actually. Um, so this is um, again, and it's. It, uh, I find it really interesting to take these materials, to take these illustrations that come from the on, from online data sets, databases, but then transform them into kind of physical objects. Now, um, the title of the show, um, Your Only Chance to Survive is to Leave With Us, came from um, the leader of a, the speech from a by a leader of a, of a cult in the 19, 90s called Marshall Applewhite and um, they believed that basically the the arrival of the Hal, Hal Bopp comet which was the brightest comet in our skies I don't know if any, if any of you are old enough to remember uh, I remember it um, the Hal Bopp comet was visible in the night sky for about six months it was an incredibly bright object in the sky and um, just as um, a sign like a comet would have been interpreted hundreds of years ago um, by, 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 superstitious, by superstitious people, uh, the Heaven's Gate cult led by Marshall Applewhite believed that uh, an, an alien spaceship uh, hid behind the comet and that when it was on its closest approach to Earth, um, they should uh, kill themselves and um, join the spaceship to leave Earth. They didn't think of it as killing themselves. They described it as um, renewing themselves. So um, the idea was that they could, they would reach a, the next level of human consciousness by leaving Earth. And this is footage 
of uh, Apple White. Uh, I, use, I, I made um, an installation in the show and um, there were two parts of it, but one of the parts was Apple White, um, uh, one of Apple White's speeches, which I modified. Um, and I'll play you an extract of it now. So Apple White would make these long videos, uh, some of them are online, um, where he would kind of spout his uh, theories and, and views. And, um, and I would just take all of the words out and just leave the breath. And, and, and I left the one phrase that inspired the show. So I'll play you a little bit of that. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. Your only chance to survive is to leave with us. Okay, I just want to check actually. Um, John, Marco, did is the audio okay? Or do I need, did I forget to click that box? No, the audio was fine. Okay. Um, so there's Apple White talking in 1996, I think that was. So a year before him and 36 other members of the, of the cult um, killed themselves in a uh, Beverly Hills mansion, I believe. Um, and uh, I think it's quite uh, amazing how in a sense, I, I kind of thought of uh, Apple White as a kind of prophet in a sense that it feels like our national leaders now have a kind of leading us into into a similar chasm, if you like. There's a kind of a, a will to abandon uh, Earth, in a sense. I mean, this this was an extreme example of that, but you have that with Musk, and I wouldn't say, and and I, I would I would say a kind of uh, absolution of responsibilities towards um, Earth that you see in a number of uh, our political leaders. Um, and uh, so yeah, so I and this was in this was last year. So um, yeah, it felt like uh, it would be really interesting to show this um, and to to, to 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 bring up Apple White in the context of um, of the time we're in now. Um, okay, so this is uh, this leads me to landfall. So um, another uh, this is. Um, Again, I guess in some ways taking inspiration from um, the Golden Record, uh, which I talked about earlier. Uh, here, this is a project called Landfall. It's a series of 15 records. It's a kind of, it's an archive of catastrophic uh, hurricanes that hit North America, uh, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean um, from 2002 to 2017. Um, I'll take you to the project page of that, um, which is here. And uh, so again, here, the material has all been collected online. Um, so each record uh, is an archive of, of recordings that I found online um, for, uh, for catastrophic hurricanes that, that hit the places I mentioned. Uh, so there's Hurricane Dennis in 2005, Hurricane Fabian, 2003. So these are picture discs, they're actual records. And the satellite image um, of the hurricane as captured by NASA's uh, weather satellites. Uh, NASA, NASA has an incredible archive of really high resolution imagery, um, tracking the movements of hurricanes across uh, across the, the, the North Atlantic, especially, and the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so I would take a, one of these high res Im images and I'd put the eye of the, um, of the storm in the middle of the record so that the spindle would go through it. And then um, I would engrave uh, onto the record uh, the sounds of the hurricanes. Now, the source material varies from radio phone-ins of people trapped in their homes as the hurricanes hitting their homes um, to that of storm chasers, just recording the sounds of the hurricanes to news correspondents um, in the field um, making reports as the as the hurricanes battering them, 
I'm going to play you an extract from Hurricane Fabian. This is from 2003. And uh, it's a radio phone in and what you'll hear is the voice of a, of a guy who uh, has barricaded himself in his house um, and talking remarkably calmly, actually, to uh, a radio, uh, this jockey. Um, so I'll play you 30 seconds of that now. The wind's blowing up against this. I have a headboard, a, a large headboard to the bed, actually up against the door, and I have a washer and dryer jamming it up against the doorway to stop it from the winds and um, debris from blowing in the house. Wow. So that's probably what you hear. Wow. Um, well, that, I was going to yeah. ask you if you could get the phone receiver a little closer to a window, but I don't want to get you in any trouble either. Right. Well, I'm, I'm around the corner. I'm not even. I'm probably about. 15 feet away from it around the corner, so. So that's Hurricane Fabian. I'll play you, um, play you another one. Um, this, this is Hurricane Otto from 2016. A late season storm in the Caribbean has been upgraded to a hurricane as authorities in Panama reported at least four people had been killed and several were missing. Heavy rains have triggered landslides, trapping some beneath the mud. A child was killed when a tree fell on a car parked outside a school in the capital, Panama City. The U.S. National Hurricane Center says Hurricane Otto is now blowing at about 120 kilometers per hour as it approaches Costa Rica and Nicaragua. So the archive, in a sense, captures um, not just the sounds of the hurricanes, but also oops, forget that. not just the sounds of the hurricanes, but also the, the different ways in which uh, our culture kind of represents the hurricane. So either live or through journalistic reporting um, or, and so on. Um, now I was thinking about actually whether, I was wondering whether I should expand the archive and just carry on kind of producing a record every time there's a, a retired hurricane. A retire, I, I forgot to mention actually, a re, these are all retired hurricanes and uh, retired hurricanes are those that were so catastrophic, caused so much damage, killed so many, um, that no hurricane will, be, will, will bear that name again. So there will never be another Hurricane Fabian, there will never be another Hurricane Felix or Dennis. Um, and, um, and so these are particularly devastating um, hurricanes. But again, as I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk, this interest in sort of finding a way to take these huge things and reduce them into kind of compact, uh, well, discs in a way in this, in, with this work, is something I'm really interested in. To take something that is so massive, so terrifying, and reduce it to something actually um, that you can hold in your hands or that you can uh, try to um, comprehend. Um, yeah, that's, so that's, that's Ladden Fall. And this is an installation shot. So we, this work was included in Your Only Chance to Survive is to leave with us. And, um, and visitors could basically uh, just grab a record. And um, there were sleeves that went with all the records as well that describe where the contents come from, whose who's are the voices that you can hear on the records. Um, and then the viewers can literally just place the record, play it, and the record plays in the space. So... Um, yeah, that, that's, it's a kind of journey through time and devastation, in a sense, natural devastation. Um, now, so returning to uh, the satellite imagery, um, obviously, one of, the, one of the things that I spent many years doing was kind of studying the, uh, the various ways in which energy infrastructure has really sort of marked the landscape. Um, and I'll, show, I'll just show you a few examples of that. Uh, these are oil fields. Um, so what I would do is I would use software like Google Earth um, and uh, I would take many, many screenshots uh, and stitch them together. I would then, to, to know, it's really important for, for me to know what I'm looking at. And uh, so I would use what are called geographic information systems. These are massive databases that basically tell you what every pipe is, what every oil well is, who it belongs to, how far in the ground it goes, and so on. I'll, I'll, I, um, 
this is a, a live demonstration. So this is the this is known as the Texas uh, Geographic Information System database. Every every U.S. state has its own uh, database. But if I zoom in here, you'll see. Let's change the the view to satellite imagery. Um, so this is satellite imagery of, of the of the Earth. And as we go closer in, you'll notice. Uh, let me see the right area, Hockley, there we go. Um, so as we zoom in, you'll notice all of these, these hundreds and thousands of dots appear on screen. And what these are is these are every single oil well um, uh, mapped. And the it's done so accurately that it corresponds exactly to the satellite image. So what we can see here is this this one here that my mouse is over. This is a this is oil well. The name of this oil well is two one nine zero two four zero six. I can see how deep it goes. It goes five thousand feet deep. It belongs to the Occidental, Occidental Permian Limited Company, and is part of the Slaughter Oil Field. Um, and this is for every single oil pump in um, in the US this information is available so basically what it allows me to do is um, when I when I look at an image like this I can do lots of research to see exactly who, what oil field this is who it belongs to um, how productive not how productive it is but how deep beneath the ground it goes and so on and it just gives me a whole other level of data and information uh, behind the image but to give you a sense, an idea of how detailed how good the imagery is um, this is actually, uh, so this is the north, this is the, uh, sorry, uh, the Wasson oil and gas field in Texas. And um, it is, uh, there's a little town in the middle of it, which is um, called um, Denver City. And you can see, if I zoom in here, you can see this is a school. And this is the oil, these are the oil pumps in the school, just in the backyard of the school. But also um, you'll see the oil pumps in people's back gardens um, and so on. And um, basically what I would do is I would take this kind of imagery and just take hundreds of screenshots and uh, in Google Earth or, or the software. And then I would stitch it all together. And basically what you'd end up with would be a huge image of amazing detail. Um, so this is, um, this is the Cedar Point oil field in uh, Galveston Bay in Texas. And what you're seeing here is drilling platforms in the middle of the bay. Um, and uh, they're dredging the bay um, to make, um, to, to, to add even more platforms. This image was, this work was done in 2012. And um, I th what I also love about this perspective is it allows you to see things that from the ground would be impossible to see. So what we what we have here is layer upon layer of industrial and agricultural produ production uh, overlaid on top of each other, basically. So again, what you see is the grid of the um, of the oil infrastructure um, with all of its pump jacks uh, superimposed onto agricultural land, and all those marks are made by tractors, which which in the which close up you can actually see you can see the tractors close up these aren't tractors these are the shadows of the pump jacks but again you get a sense of um, of the the energy and the um, uh, and the extent of the production on the land and extraction from the land and then obviously what that what this way of working allows you to do is to make these really pretty amazing kind of tableaus uh, so this is um, this is and, and and it was really simple to make actually these are just 24 sheets um, inkjet prints um, and uh, they're just assembled as a mosaic in the same way that they exist in the real world um, but it allows you to make these really huge installations so that when you're actually uh, standing in front of it uh, you, it, it, the feeling I wanted to evoke was that of that, that I later found with uh, Felix Baumgartner. This idea that you're kind of suspended above the Earth uh, in in the form of a satellite almost, and you're 
you're seeing Earth from this perspective, um, which again is impossible to see on the ground, even though we are on the ground when we're looking at it. Um, so this is that same work face on. And then uh, I got the chance in um, 2015 to, uh, uh, to, to show uh, another iteration of this work in uh, Le, Le Musée des Beaux-Arts in Le Clock in Switzerland, Le Locle in Switzerland, thanks to Natalie Hirschdorfer. And um, we decided to try and, and produce the longest print we could of a, from a single sheet of paper. And again, so this is hundreds of um, screen captures that, that are then assembled, stitched together, and uh, printed out in a single um, on a single sheet. So it's this work is thirteen meters by a meter and a half long, and um, and it's the first work I ever made where it's impossible to see the image as a whole in, in it in its entirety, um, and um, again, if you think of photography and photographs. You know, we always, photography is, some, is this very accessible uh, thing that does what I was describing before, it reduces the world into a very kind of compact, manageable form, you know, on a small piece of paper or on a big piece of paper. But in this case, I wanted to make, make a, an image that was too big to be seen uh, in its entirety. And uh, I think we achieved that with this. I also wanted to give it a feel of a mausoleum, in a sense, you, a visitor could visit an image and an industry uh, lying in wake. Um, well, that was 2015. That's when I thought um, the oil industry was on its way out. Um, but I think but I was a bit premature with that. Um, now, I'm just going to show you briefly another project, which um, I mean, I, I thought I'd, I was done with uh, satellite imagery. Uh, I, I, I felt like I made um, everything I could, I said everything I could say about it and uh, didn't want to uh, carry on working with that. But um, it turns out that um, I revisited the American landscape and was really surprised at how wind turbines had uh, started to kind of really occupy many parts of the US. So this is the, um, this is the uh, US wind um, farm database and again it's a similar in a similar way to the to the oil fields you get a sense here of um, not only the quantity but also the placement um, of these turbines so every dot is a, is a is a is a wind turbine and also they're color coded because every color represents a different farm if you like a different wind farm so we can click on here and what we'll information about what the wind turbine is, how high it is, what its uh, power capacity is, uh, who the manufacturer is, and its exact location. And then obviously when you have that kind of information, so I I, uh, I made this work. This was, again was a sh another show at Gallery, of, uh, at Bianconi Gallery in Milan. This was my first show there. Uh, the same place where I showed your only chance to survive. And, um, and so I made these, um, prints of, of the turbines, but place them on the wall in the same way as they appeared in, on, on the land. So, and, and the way that the turbines are placed on the land is uh, correlates to wind patterns. So I really liked the possibility of actually displaying works on the wall uh, as determined by wind patterns on the ground. Uh, so this is Camp Grove Wind Farm in Illinois. And this is Meadow Creek in Bonneville, Idaho. And uh, I made I made these as uh, diptychs, triptychs, and quads. So twos, threes, and fours. Um, and uh, you can see more of those on my website if, if you're interested. Um, now, how are we doing for time, everyone? John, Marco, how yeah, are we doing for we time? Are, we're doing fine. It's uh, 10 to 7 now. Okay, um, just because we're about to enter feedlots, it's quite a long thing. And then let me see, there's after that. Yeah, I can, I'll talk about feedlots quite quickly. Uh, there's a lot of slides there. I'll just go, I'll talk about it quickly. Um, 
So again, when I was when I was working with the oil fields, I came across these structures in uh, on the ground, and I had no idea what they were. And um, th those circles, if you're wondering, they're they're called center pivot irrigation fields. So it's a way of watering the land. It's basically a long water sprinkler um, that turns on a pivot and it sprinkles, it, it, it irrigates the land. And that's why you end up with these circular shapes. But in the midst of all of this, of all these landscapes, I would find these structures, like the one you see right in the middle here. Um, and this is Coronado Feeders in Dalhart, Texas. And um, I kept coming across these sites and had no idea what they were. And it led me to this crazy world of kind of intensive beef uh, farming in the US. So these are massive, uh, cattle farms that can contain can can contain hundreds of thousands of be of cows, and uh, basically farmers feed them a diet of growth hormones and um, corn and antibiotics uh, in order to accelerate the cow's growth. And um, so, rather than taking five years or so for a cow to reach its full mature weight, these farms reduce that time to um, about 16 months. So it's a kind of an accelerated growth and an excel it's a way of accelerating a life cycle of an animal for maximum kind of yield. And, um, and I, I was stunned by them. I felt like they were, they, they were looking at them was like looking at a blueprint of our civilization in a sense, or, or not, not our civilization, but of our economic and political system. So every black dot you can see there is a cow and the red lagoon is actually the toilet, if you like. It's, it, it's the lagoons that collect all of the animal waste. Um, no cows are killed on these farms. They're just, um, they're fattened up and then either sold off or given back to the farmers who place them there to then go to slaughter and uh, enter the, the, the uh, food um, chain. Uh, this is uh, Tascosa feed yard in Bushland in Texas, another um, huge um, farm. And again, this is a green lagoon in the middle. The, the colors uh, are determined by the types of chemicals that farmers might use to try and break down the animal waste. Um, so in this case, you have this kind of bright green and the previous one, a, a deep red. And um, again, I felt like what the detail of these images allowed us to do was see the kind of, um, yeah, the blueprint of how these farms are constructed. And, um, you know, I'm not a vegan, I'm not an animal activist by any means, um, but I felt that actually the, these were a metaphor for, for how we think of life and death in our own culture and society. Um, and um, yeah. Now, the, the real paradox with this work, and I had no idea about this at the time when I made it, was that it was actually illegal in many states to photograph these farms. So uh, beef producers who were really concerned about animal activists kind of photographing and revealing to the American consumer where their beef came from, uh, these uh, industrialists would lobby uh, lawmakers to enact laws in various states that made it illegal to photograph them. So you have cases of George Steinmetz, for example, a really famous, well-known, uh, respected photographer for National Geographic. Uh, he was arrested for, for taking photos of a Kansas feedlot. Um, and there are, there are many other examples of that. Now, so Americans have never really seen um, where uh, their beef came from. And, uh, and I made this work, uh, Vice were really interested in it and they put it on the cover of their magazine and uh, the work went viral uh, from that point on and um, kind of took off in ways that I could never have imagined. Um, this is on Reddit, somebody posted uh, the work and it led to two and a half thousand comments with some really brilliant uh, contributions actually by farmers who talked about, uh, who actually broke down the image and explained what every element of the image was. So where the corn feed was, where, where the feed was mixed, uh, what the different tracks were uh, and so on, uh, as well as, uh, you know, really banal comments from, from other observers. Um, 
and then it, the, the work found a life in uh, American editorial magazines. Um, so this is in December 2015. This is New Republic, actually, a Brit British magazine. Um, uh, this is the LA Times. I was invited by them to, to, to write an op-ed piece uh, based on this work. Um, Fast Company, so a business website, took interest as well. Russia Today uh, featured the work uh, a number of times in various guises. And even Meatpacking Journal, the the uh, the authority on all news relating to meatpacking, the international magazine for the meat and poultry industry, they um, they paid me a fee to to feature the work uh, as a spread and and gave me um, uh, and and allowed me to write a small piece for them about the work. And again, I talked about the work in the context of uh, of culture um, and. Um, yeah. Anyway, it was really interesting to see this work end up in so many different places. And then obviously in the art context as well, this is Spencer Museum of Art bought, bought one of the prints for, for their collection. Um, German art magazines featured it. Um, this is obviously the more standard art kind of context, prints on a wall. Um, this is the v &A, but again, just to show you the scale, how, how large I like to produce these works. And then in the end, you know, I, I loved the, the, this is art forum. Uh, they featured it on the cover and um, it wasn't too long after Meatpacking Journal featured it on, on in, in their magazine. And I, for me, that, that I really loved the way in which uh, an image, these images uh, circulated all across the culture from um, from satirical TV shows to Meatpacking Journal to, to, to art forum. Um, and the art market is a bit of a meat market anyway, so it felt really apt. And uh, this featured on the cover because Rem Koolas, who's a big Dutch architect, he he is really interested in the series and considers feedlots as a kind of what he describes as a smart architecture. And um, he has a show on at the Guggenheim at the moment in New York, and they featured um one of a detail from one of the images in, in an installation there um but then also the work circulated in um in various medical journals and health journals and educational curriculums that kind of stuff um and um and after so many years of circulating in in the culture um you know, activists would, will write to me and ask me if they can use the image. And all I ever ask for is, uh, with activists, is to just send me evidence of how they used the work so, so that I can talk about it later on. And this is a, a, a Nia Seni who wrote to me. Uh, she was participating in a protest and I sent her a high res image so that she could print it out and make a um, protest board out of it. And um, this guy, uh, is an activist in the US called Will Potter, and he came across the series and um, uh, crowdfunded. It was a really successful crowdfunding campaign to uh, photograph lots from drones. He was kind of inspired by this work as a way of trying to change the law on um, the prohibition of photographing feedlots. And sure enough, um, in the last few years, the laws have changed. And uh, these protests against what, what are called ag-gag laws, the agricultural gagging laws, which prevent the photographing of these sites, have been overturned in a number of states. Uh, so this is in Wyoming, this is in Idaho, uh, and so on. So in a way, what's fascinating to me is that the satellite, in a sense, exploited a loophole in ground law, if you like, in ground-based law, the, the satellites didn't apply to these prohibitions for, of, of seeing things. And, um, and yeah, I find that really fascinating that the, that the satellite, that this abundance of imagery that the satellites produce in a way slipped through um, this loophole and allowed somebody like me to, to make visible these sites. In fact, there's there's a question in the chat, Mishka, that uh, is connected to this. They are asking uh, Janice McLaren is asking if you had any legal issues, legal issues with this with this work. No, I've never I've never had any. 
No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, it brings me on to a, a more recent project, Seven Seas and a River. This was um, a work commissioned for a festival in Italy, uh, in Reggio Emilia, in 2017, I think. And um, I've been fascinated by webcams for, for a long time, uh, live webcams especially. And, um, and I noticed that um, there are thousands of webcams all over the world pointing at the sea. Um, and so I, I created an installation of eight screens. Um, and these are, these are all aut automated cameras. So even the movement is automated. These are not held by human hands. Um, and I was really fascinated that they were just pointing at the sea and nothing much seemed to be happening. But these are all live. What you're seeing now are live images. Um, but this one here is uh, in Japan. It's actually Mount Fuji. If I go back, I wonder if you can see it very right. Uh, it's the middle of the night in Japan right now. Oh, yeah, that's, so there's Mount Fuji. It's one of uh, Hawkeye's famous views of Mount Fuji, and they put a webcam there. Um, this is Santa Monica Beach, the top right. Um, and in the bottom right, it's actually the St. Lawrence River in Quebec, uh, but that's gone offline, as has this one. Can't remember which one this one is. This is St. Bart's uh, live webcam, and this is uh, an amazing view over a Norwegian town. Um, and it's just, uh, it's always like this for the most part. The lighting changes. It's this beautiful, beautifully still image. Anyway, part of the attraction of making this work as a live installation for me was that the feeds don't always work. So I, I placed all, all eight screens in a circle and viewers could kind of walk in and, uh, and watch these live feeds of oceans and rivers all around the world at the same time, but obviously in different time zones. And occasionally a feed would go down. So the crew had a backup list of, of, of other live feeds that they could replace one that was down with. In a sense, it was, um, I really liked that um, it was a kind of control room, if you like. What that control room is and who it's for is really not clear. It's, it's not really clear. Um, who's watching these feeds, why they're there. Um, but again, I love that we have the cameras pointing to the ocean as if we feel maybe that the end of our civilization will come from the ocean and that it's somehow a threat. Or maybe it's something sublime and beautiful that we that we just love to look at. And obviously one of, what was amazing actually with that show was that, uh, Screen, the power of the screen is quite remarkable. I don't think I've ever had anybody, I don't think I've ever had people engage me with my work as much as when there were eight screens in the room. There's something really mesmerizing about the screen, but also about looking at the ocean. And so there's that combination of the ocean and the screen coming together in a quite mesmerizing uh, experience for, for people. So that, that, was, that was really interesting. I'm also working with a, a friend Vasim Bati on an installation um, for a festival in uh, the UK that was postponed because of the virus. Um, but uh, we'll also, also show it in Montreal next year. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a series of webcams pointing at volcanoes, um, but also kind of footage natural disasters. I'll, sh I'll play you a tiny clip of one of those uh, at the end. I've just got one more work to show you which is uh, this work. I'm not the only one. It's, it's, um, so we started with solar system. We're finishing kind of in people's bedrooms and living rooms, which is where you are and uh, where I am. And uh, this is work called, I'm not the only one. Um, again, I, I really loved the journey of, that, of the camera from like I said, from the solar system, from the far reaches of the solar system and our universe, in fact, to, to people's living rooms. In this case, um, amateur singers singing Sam Smith's I'm Not the Only One. I'm going to play it for you. It's about four minutes long. Um, and after that, I'll show you one very brief work and then we can open it up for questions. Do <clears throat> do 
watching, you guys. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I kind of messed up, messed, messed up on some parts. But thanks for watching. Like, even if it was horrible, and like, even if it was bad, I don't care. Comment what you thought, and subscribe. Thanks. Okay, so that was uh, <clears throat> I'm Not the Only One. And um, I'm just going to end up with, I'm just going to finish with this. This is a work in progress. This is something that I'm working with my uh, friend Vasim uh, Bati with on. And uh, there are different iterations to this work. We're working with found footage of uh, earthquakes, uh, landslides, tsunamis, floods, um, uh, and this is these are these are um, lightning strikes. And uh, the idea is to make a kind of installation that is a kind of visual. It's like taking natural disaster and turning the volume up to 11 in a sense, but visually and orally as well. And uh, this is just, this is rough, this is a rough draft. We haven't quite nailed exactly how uh, we're gonna show it, but I thought I'd show it to you because I, I feel like it, it's a, it really forms part of, of uh, the story that I'm telling in a way. Um, obviously all of this footage comes from people's mobile phones quite simply, and dashboard cams. So it's very short, it's 30 seconds long, uh, but it will give you a taste of it, um, of the work. Yeah, it's been a while since we had a storm coming from a direction we can actually see it. Okay, and um, that's it. Um, that, that's the end of, of uh, the presentation. I'll leave it with the lightning strikes. Thank so, you so much, Mishka. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I have a, we have a couple of questions from the audience that I wanted to, to share with you. In fact, I asked for the to the people who send the questions to open their, to their microphones so they can uh, ask you directly. So maybe uh, John McLean. Hi, Mishka. Hi, John. Really enjoyed the talk. I have a, a quick question for you, if I may. You produce many projects which are the results of different thoughts, thought processes, and research. What do you think links them all together do you sometimes have ideas for new projects which you abandon because they don't forget they don't fit within this evolving Mishka puzzle? Oh my God. No, not at all. I mean, I'm working on stuff all the time. Most of it is rubbish. And the reason I don't put it out there isn't because it doesn't fit in my puzzle, it's because it's no good. I mean, I'm I'm really, I'm really demanding of uh what I make and I'll make something and sit on it for ages and then go back to it. And often I'll go back to it and it, and it's just, it means nothing anymore. And if that's the case, then I don't want to put it out there. Um, so, you know, I mean, I look at, I look at my work and I, I wonder if there's just too much variety, actually. I don't feel like it is a very, coherent mass really but I also feel that that's somebody else that's that's other people's jobs really to to find coherence I mean I try and come up with something coherent for a talk um so I mean one thing I, I, I have been thinking about doing is trying to to make more of a performance of this and finding a kind of story that fits it all together I used to work in theatre a lot and I really love the idea of you know storytelling through these images and stories and I feel like the subjects are really rich so there's plenty of opportunity to do something like that but um yeah I um I I have not had a, as much chance to work on that as I'd like to um but I mean if you think it's a really coherent puzzle then 
that's all right. I think I think you are at the you're obviously at the center of this puzzle. There's a biographical element in your work. Um, but they are kind of satellite ideas. And I was wondering how you see your earliest works in relation to your latest works. Do you see kind of a line between them or is it more complicated than that? Well, I think in the beginning, I was really, when I, when I you know, when I joined ABC, uh, the, the co-op um, that John uh, is in and the, uh, the founder, Joachim Schmidt, is here uh, as well. You know, I was really, I felt like I was in an incredibly inspiring environment where all of the interrogations I wanted to do about photography, about documentary photography, I was in an environment where suddenly, you know, there were collage artists, there were conceptual artists, there were photographers, but there was this really playful way of, of making work that, that really kind of interrogated the idea of photography. And I feel like at the beginning, for the first five years, maybe the first four years, most of my projects were a kind that interrogation of what is photography. So I did photography is astronomical, even no man's land, which I haven't talked about tonight. Lots of projects, collected portraits, um, winning mentality, just loads of works that were really, yeah, trying to figure out what could photography be or what was photography in this internet age. You know, and I, and, and I take inspiration from, lo, you know, so many artists uh, from the work that they would make. And and it was it was like a really it felt like a really rich dialogue and conversation, really. Um, it's, I feel I think it still is, really. Um, but I guess now my focus is less on interrogating what photography is than I, I guess I'm trying to interrogate, interrogate the moment that we're in, like. You know, I've got two young kids and I don't want to think of a, of the world as having no future, for example. So I think a lot of my work lately has been on this environmental stuff because it feels like we're told every day that, the, that, the, that we're screwed and that the world, that we have no future. And I kind of refuse to believe it. I want to believe that actually all of it is a const cultural construct in a way and isn't and photography and film are brilliant at revealing how things are constructed and um so i feel i feel that that's where that's what my work is is doing right now thanks so much mishka and thanks john for the question we have max colson who also has a question um let's find hi, max. <laughs> hi hi mishka thanks a lot for the talk it was yeah it was really really fascinating to and also to see new, the new work. Um, uh, I, I've got a question which is, is kind of, um, I guess it's related to what you're just speaking about, about kind of having positions about the world and making work about the world that, and the moment that we're in. And my question is, how do your projects start? Is it with visual investigations and tests before you get to an out outcome and a kind of, I guess, a position on a technology or a way of visualizing the world? Or do you have a, an outcome mind in uh, an outcome in mind from the start? Um, I guess, like, what role does play and experimentation have in producing a final work, especially if you're chucking out loads of stuff? You know? Well, the experimentation is everything, really. I mean, I'll I'll come across something and I'll agonise for weeks and months on how best to find a form for it. So, like the patents, I mean, that took me ages. I, you wouldn't believe the amount of different things I went through with the patent. Something as simple as a patent illustration, and so many subjects as well. There's so many things I can do with it, and I've just you know, I've really struggled to find a form for it. I felt like that, I felt the the plaques were a really nice way of giving form to that because they had a really nice echo with the pioneer plaques um, and this idea of just, of communicating very complex ideas through really simple line drawings. I really love that. Um, but again, how do you, what do you do with it? Apart from, you know, the thing itself is so good that if you're gonna do anything else, it better be better it's got to be better but what is that better you know um and then so sometimes you just come across things and it's a gift it just feels like a gift 
uh, and you don't need to do much to it really. Um, I mean, the satellite images are, 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 are kind of like that. They're so glorious, so, so, some of them, that they just, they make themselves almost. But then you've got other things where, yeah, it's they don't make themselves. You really have to figure out what the best way of getting them out there is. Uh, you know, the, the live streams, again, that's amazingly simple. Uh, I remember, you know, just thinking, just show eight live streams. Wow. How simple is that? But if they're good live streams, there's nothing better. Um, so, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, listen, my, I mean, I spend my life agonizing and trying stuff and failing. You know, you're only seeing like 2% of what I make. Um, you'd be horrified if you saw the rest. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you gotta kill your darlings. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, Mishka, uh, you have shown uh, a few works about the uh, like the impact of the industry or the, the the food industry or many other industries and economics on on the land and on the environment, using uh, mostly network images to represent that impact. I was wondering if you ever have thought on analyzing also the environmental impact of the network image on thinking on the, on the, on the network image also as an agent that uh, hits uh, into the environment and, the, and all these issues that, that you raise in your work. No, I mean, and there are, there are other artists doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not something I'm, I've given much thought to really. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question from Eric, Eric Gellard, which I need to find and unmute. Maybe John, you can help me. Because in the meantime, I also want to congratulate, I think Joachim Schmidt uh, is in Zoom and managed to write his uh, first- uh, um... I, I think I managed to unmute me. Hi. Oh, great. Eric can ask the question. In, in the meantime, I want to send my congratulations to Joachim Schmidt. For, can you hear me? For finding the window where to type. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. <sighs> You can go, Eric, you can go ahead and, and make the question if you want to. And you can also, if you want to, you can turn on your camera. But it's just up to you. Can you hear me right now? Yes. yes. Go. OK, sorry, my, my connection is bad. So uh, I, I just uh, wondered. Um, uh, about the technical issue, because when I take a screenshot, it has like 96 dots per inch. And how do you create high resolution images with imagery uh, like that? This would be a technical interest. How do you create that? And a second question, as the screenshot is a major, um, yeah, does it also have a philosophical meaning? just a mere tool so the first thing is um the computer i use is remarkably lo-fi your phone is probably better than my computer um and to to increase the resolution from 96 dpi to 300 dpi i go into photoshop image size and I type 300 where 96 is, and then I press return. And it's it's suddenly a 300 DPI image. <laughs> it's amazing. It's magic, really. Um, and uh, what's the other question? Philosophical. Well, um, yeah, it kind of is philosophical. It's very Zen. Um, so my mom, I'll show you. My mum found this. My mum found this book on my bookshelf the other day, and uh, it's a German book on how to take photographs. Right, it's a guide on on tips, tools, and techniques for making better pictures. And my mum said, "Why have you got this book?" And I said, "I, I don't know." And then I suddenly remembered. Oh, I remember now because they um, they featured my feedlots. Right there it is. So they featured my my feedlot, and then and my mom said, "Why is why have they featured your feedlot in here? This is about 
tips for better taking better pictures. And I said, I know. My tip for taking better pictures is to just press the print screen button. This print screen button. So you don't need any fancy uh, cameras or anything. It's just, uh, just it's, it's there. And then, and I guess in a way, it's quite zen, right? Because it's you don't need all of this kit. You don't need to spend thousands of pounds. You've sh you've seen how crap my keyboard is. It's not even a good keyboard. It's not even a great computer. But you don't need much. Uh, I'm making all this stuff using pretty crude tools. And again, I think it's yeah, it's kind of quite zen in a way. Is to just take things as they are. Use what you have. Uh, work within your limitations. Um, and I guess, yeah, you could say, I kind of laughed when you asked, is there a philosophical thought behind it? Because I thought, well, uh, is there? But I think, yeah, maybe there is. And it is, it's just use what you have. And uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess that's, uh, yeah, maybe uh, it's time to wrap up. It's 7.30, uh, we've been here. Um, enjoying a lot uh, all your uh, explanations and the, and the words that you have shown us, uh, Mishka. Um, thank you so much for, for, for being here and for, for leaving this screen walk. And thank you as well to everyone who has, who has joined and has shared this, this time with us. Um, thank you so much also from my side. Um, thanks so much, uh, Mishka and everybody for joining and the questions and the discussion. We look forward to seeing you all in two weeks again here with uh, Maria Guta and on uh, uh, screenworks.com. So as tradition now, please, John, uh, unmute everybody and uh, let's uh, have everyone um, thank Mishka on their way out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Great to see so many friends there as well. Thanks so Hi, much. Mishka. Nice to see Hi, you. Thank you. you so much, Mishka.